I'm available to go. Uh, I, I would like to say because I broke a bone early in January and while skateboarding, so there's not much I can do when it comes to movement. Yeah. So, uh, has anyone among us have access to any Bluefield DPUs or worked on them before? You have? Yes, I did. Uh, nice. So, yeah, we have been working on Bluefield DPUs for some time. And I'm going to tell you about what they are and how we are trying to use them and what we can do <laughs> with DPUs or at least DPU framework if you don't have the hardware at, at, at this point in time. So yeah, first, what is a DPU? Uh, a DPU is a network card. It is a high-speed network card, 200, 400, 800 gigabits per second fast. And usually network cards these days have uh, quite a bunch of offloads, which make the high speed pro uh, uh, transfers happen because processors these days, they are not even able to make packets to the speeds of like 40 or 60 gigabits per second. The max I could get from a processor with TCP IP was 70 gigabits per second. So the card has to make packets. And uh, many cards, most of the cards have these infinite band RDMA offloads where the NIC makes the packet. Uh, but even these kind of offloads does not make a device uh, a network DPU. It has to have a general processing unit, like either an FPGA or some general purpose core running an OS. And an example of that is a Bluefield DPU by NVIDIA. It has a few ARM cores, 8 in Bluefield 3, 16, uh, 8 in Bluefield 2, 16 in Bluefield 3, and they're not very fast, but it's something we can leverage, definitely. And the, the, the usual way for programming GPUs is TOKA. Um, for what CUDA is for GPUs, uh, TOKA is for DPUs. And you need quite an intense amount of network knowledge to program DPUs. Uh, either UCX, RDMA, FlexIO. I mean, that's not the kind of uh, knowledge usually domain-specific programmers are supposed to have. What they know is OpenMP. Um, OpenMP has a bunch of features already. Uh, you can have uh, multi-threading in it. You can have tasking in it. And recently, uh, for a few years now, it also has offloading. Just do pragma OMP target around the block and the block runs on the device. And you can select the device by just uh, telling it its device number, using the device close. And how do you know the device number? The compiler gives you the utility to know the device number. Uh, in case of Clang LLVM, this is LLVM OMP device info. And the device we can see is a uh, Volta GPU in Power9 cluster in BSC. Um, and exchange data using map close either to or from or both the uh, pointer which is buff uh, starting which is zero and then the length of the array. Um, how do you use it for DPUs? Well, we did the work for you in the Ordos OpenMP DPU of loading support project and you just have to change the number and the program will run on the DPU. And how do you know what is the number? Using the same utility, which for example, like this is, although it's a network card, uh, which has an uh, interface named IB0, and, uh, but, but we can use it as an accelerator because the network card has a bunch of ARM cores inside it. Um, so if you, if you run this code in DPU, like, you know, printing something in the DPU or incrementing something, it runs. It just has to run. Uh, we just have to run a service on the DPU side. Here on the left, we can see that um, the the left side is DPU and the right side is host. So when we run the application, it it actually prints the printf test 
in the DPU side where there's a service running, an OpenMP service that we developed and it runs the code on DPU. Um, yeah, uh, okay. We are here. Yeah. Uh, we can do asynchronous stuff as well. We're like using uh, tasks and nowhere closes. The code can run in parallel on both devices and that's where the DPUs shine most because they don't accelerate anything, but we can get performance out of concurrency. So overlap is our major uh, point that benefits us. But pretty much nobody has access to Bluefield devices and sometimes you and I don't. So I, I the, the servers, some servers went down in like November and I did not have any access to Bluefield devices. So what we did was develop Pidoka, which is an emulator and it offloads the calls to DPU in exactly the same framework. But instead of offloading to DPU, it, it either offloads locally or offloads to another device through the, by passing data over and binaries over the network. Um, so this is the stack of uh, usual um, all those applications we have. Um, this is the shared library, which is the primary plugin, libomptarget.rtl.bf, and it uses libdoka and some other libraries, but primarily libdoka. So we can use pdoka instead of libdoka, but with the same dopdoka API. So the framework doesn't change, everything remains same, just the underlying library changes, and it uses TCP to get things done. I tried UCX2, but TCP is easier, so let's stick to that for now. Uh, and to get it working, we just need a bunch of uh, environment variables. First is LD preload, that instead of uh, using Doka, your libraries, use, use pdoka library. And then wherever is our server, which is, uh, the server is the service where you want to run your accelerated code, which would act like DPU. That is the server IP and server port, wherever that is running. Um, and yeah, this uh, running LLV on the device info while exporting all of those, uh, they give, they show the network devices as they are uh, network accelerators or, or DPU devices, which they are not, but since we are just emulating things, why not show them like that? Um, yeah, so the, to run our previous OpenMP offloading framework with pdoka, we have to do the same thing, like running service first and then running application. But now service can be run anywhere uh, and it doesn't have to be a DPU and it will offload the application to that device. Given that server IP is correctly set and server port. Oh, and I was able to run it. I'm sorry if it is so small, I can describe things. And here I'm offloading MPI communication in the emulated DPU. Uh, the ab above side is the host, is the, the real host, and the below is emulated DPU, which is the host itself, but uh, I'm using it as an emulator. So yeah, the MPI run has, the, the application that has, that has code to send and receive is the above one. But the actual send and receive happens in the service which gets the binary and then does the transfers for for the host. So in this manner, like the DPU is doing the MPI communication and or pre or post network processing while a host can work on other stuff. Yeah. And yeah, just that pre doka is not complete doka. It is just Toka com channel, which is required by 
OpenMP DPU offloading support. And we would like to welcome you to uh, come and uh, contribute to make it more complete framework for if you, if you ever want to use our uh, DPUs for your own thing. And yeah, this is my team. I'm the engineer who actually works on things. And these guys help me with design and management of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, we are always actively looking for personnel. And we are having this Werner Nordstrom Hackathon. We have that every year, um, which is sponsored by, again, HPC Now. Um, looking forward to see you there as well. It's just a fun place where we talk and have fun while discussing problems. There's, there's nothing competitive in that besides the name. Yep, that's all. Thank you. Anyways, just... Yeah, any questions? Yes, questions. Somebody in the audience has any questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> apart from the usual use case of uh, of uh, offloading network operations and some other, um, I don't know, storage uh, operations as well, what other use cases do you find convenient for uh, DPUs? Um, wherever there's concurrency, for example, if there's a neural network, so the fault papers are the following: if if there's some computation happening and you have to uh, re, uh, let's come back to the, a more basic example. A deep neural network is running, it's training, and you need to validate it after a few iterations. So validation can be run in DPU. Or if uh, there are iterations running for any like a hello exchange kind of thing, you have to reconfigure neighbors after like 20 or 40 iterations, that can be done in DPU. So whenever there's concurrency, DPUs can help with that. Like the primary use case is in clouds where uh, virtual machines are managed in DPU, so the so the management does not take any power in the host. But we are exploring in uh, the use case of DPUs in HPC here. Yeah. Okay. So a, a possible use case could be that I mean um, setting up the management thing on the DPU or or the operating system, if you like, in the DPU and providing the full power of the rest of the machine for computational tasks. Yeah, that, that is... I mean, kind, kind of the other way around. I mean, uh, instead instead of a, a, a host uh, with an accelerator, then having a DPU and then the, the real computation yeah. occurs in the... In the that server. is exactly how clouds are using DPUs, but there there's not much of management in HPC workloads. But but yeah, even that can be... So even when management is there, it has there has to be a way for domain scientists to to run that management code in the DPU and running that m making something specific for DPUs and then running it here and there that complicates things a lot for uh, someone who does not want to learn specific things like Doka or CUDA for accelerators. So it just supports how to how you use. This framework just supports how you use DPUs. It does not uh, bind you to use it as an accelerator or management device. It's upon the user. Yeah, thank you. Got So, a uh, question from the audience. We have plenty of time. Uh, if not, I have one because I'm, today is the first day that I listen about DPUs. Uh, can you put me an example of what is Useful for? Uh, what is used for? Yeah, a practical example. Um, okay, so in again, in cloud community, they are use, uh, <clears throat> they sell virtual machines, and those virtual machines need to be managed. If they, they are managing the virtual machines on the same cores on, as a system, those cores are, can be sold to user. So instead of managing in the host, they manage it in, them in DPUs. So the entire host is uh, for available for customers. Another use case is what uh, is in MWebPitch DPU, which is an MPI implementation. Uh, MPI collectives, which are like very, they take a lot of time, like MPI 
I reduce MPI, I or to all. Um, all of them have been offloaded to DPU to to just run there, and while they're running there, the HPC workload can run on the host. Similarly, again, validation, uh, the deep neural network validation is done on GPUs while the ho uh, on the DPUs while the host and GPU are training. Uh, yeah, and there are ex there, there can be examples like uh, doing some pre and post uh, network processing or some domain specific workloads, but the only one that has been explored yet is MiniMD, where uh, the neighbors are reconfigured after every twenty iterations, but that reconfiguration is not done in the host; it's done in the DPU to for the host to have more time for processing iterations. And you say that sometimes you don't have access to that is because they are not manufacturing a lot or is because they are not installing in a place that you can access? Uh, the cost is four times more than the, like, so it is just, a DPU is a Connect X7 smart NIC, 400 gigabit NIC with some ARM cores. So just adding ARM cores increases the price by 4X. So yeah, it doesn't make sense uh, by the price point and then again, uh, it doesn't have a proven use case uh, in HPC community yet. In cloud community, DPUs are everywhere, but they're nowhere to be seen for now in HPC community, only in clusters to to test things and make a case for DPUs. But I'm sure they'll be coming soon. That was my next question. <laughs> but yeah, is a, that it will come uh, soon. Yeah, as soon as we prove the use case, I think they'll, they will be everywhere. Any other question from the audience? So if not, let's sing Osman again. <laughs>